and welcome to Timeless with Julie Hartman Live. I'm Julie Hartman. We've got Sean Regis McConnell in the Producers Dungeon. Hello, Sean. What? Huh? Happy Monday. <laughs> you really what? don't like when I call you Regis. Huh? <laughs> Only because it reminds me of my dead grandfather. But other than that. Oh, great. Great association. <laughs> <laughs> it's Monday. March 11th, 2024, and you can call into the show if you would like to talk with me live on the air. Of course, though, as you know, you can also use the chat as long as you keep it classy. That's our rule. But if you do want to call in, the number is 844-861-5537. That's 844-861-5537. Ask me anything. And in fact, throw me some curveballs. I want people to call in and, and challenge me. Whenever I guest host uh, for, for Dennis Prager or Mike Gallagher or Brandon Tatum, I challenge the listeners. I go call in and, and, and try to throw me off. So uh, I like a, a, a good discussion. So let's engage in that. By the way, Sean, do they have a way of seeing the phone number if people aren't tuning in right in the first minute and a half of the live stream? Is it in the description? Slash in the can description it, of the YouTube? Of the YouTube. Slash can it it's be in added? The, it's, in, it's in the past episodes. It's not in the current live Oh, so we have to make people sense. do some digging. Okay, yeah, well. It's on, and Alejo throws it up on the screen every now and then. Okay, cool. That's, yeah. that's all I want. Uh, you want us to add it? Can we add stuff to the thing? Yeah, let's let's have it up. We'll so do that, it off the air. Yeah, we'll get it put up there. <laughs> so, that, so that people uh, have it. So... This live stream, as you know, is uh, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. By the way, Dennis and Julie, I know I give these reminders a lot, but it's important. Dennis and Julie is on Sundays at that same time. But, you know, a lot has happened since last Wednesday. Uh, he, Sean number, is just giving a big up thumbs up. Now, oh, yeah. good. Uh, uh, the number is up. A lot has happened since last Wednesday that we need to catch up on. Yeah, the Oscars were last night. I don't know about you, Shanzi. I didn't watch a second of the Oscars. I watched some clips on Twitter, but I didn't watch any of that, which is interesting well, because I... That's more than I watched. I remember growing up, yeah. the Oscars were the event that people watched. I would look forward to it. My parents would have, you know, Oscar parties. We'd invite people over, have some popcorn. We'd we'd all know generally the movies and the actors and actresses. And when something would happen, like I remember when Jennifer Lawrence tripped on the stairs going up to get her award. When something happened, you were so interested in it and you knew that you were going to go to school the next day. In my case, I was still in elementary slash high school and talk about that moment at the Oscars. But but I don't think that people have the same level of interest as they did. But we're going to be talking uh, at the end of the show about some pre past Oscar moments, which everyone should know about, because the golden age of the Oscars is a spectacular uh, tangent to go off on internet, a uh, deep dive to, to do late into, into the night. So please do stay tuned for that. And we'll also be talking about another big thing that happened, which was the State of the Union. I did watch that, unfortunately. And, you know, we discussed on the show last week if Maureen Dowd's fantasy would come true. That was the title of her New York Times piece, My Joe Biden Fantasy, which is a little bit suspect of a title. But we were talking about whether her, her fantasy would come true and Joe Biden would pull an LBJ and uh, step down as the nominee. But that did not happen. But did you see, Sean, did you watch Katie Britt? afterwards on CNN and on Fox? Uh, no, but I've seen the way the, the left has been mocking her ever since. And I it blows my mind that the Believe Every Woman, the hashtag Me Too party, really jumps on Republican moms. I don't understand it. Oh, totally. They did it to Sarah Palin. They, they just, you, you would think Katie Britt was a lunatic. The well, way she's been treated. Look, it may not have been a good look, but come on. Oh, absolutely. Do we hear every woman? Oh, I totally agree with you. So for those who are unaware, this whole controversy is that Katie Britt, in giving the rebuttal, she's a senator, by the way, from Alabama, she referenced this woman who was the victim of human trafficking at the border. And then it was discovered that although Senator Britt in the rebuttal was attributing that human trafficking to the policies of President Biden, the woman that she was talking about was the victim of human trafficking under President Bush like 15 years ago. I totally take your point. And, and the thing that drives me crazy is, you know, there are there are no limits to the absurdity and deceit 
that the left can go to. They can make people into furries. You know, there can be literal crap on the street. They can say the most outrageous things. Later in the show, we're, we're going to be talking about these, these crazy murder stories. These people in Long Island literally murdered and chopped up a body, two bodies actually, and dispersed it all over Long Island. And they're, they're not being held on bail because of New York State's cash bail policies. Apparently, chopping up a body is not a crime that is a uh, requisite uh, for bail. But the point is, you know, the left can do all all kinds of crazy stuff. But then on the right, if Katie Brick gets a detail wrong, which she should not have gotten wrong, but if she gets a detail wrong, it's like a whole referendum on conservatism and on republicanism. So your point is well taken, Sean. But I got to say, I was watching her rebuttal and it wasn't so much of what she was saying. It was how she was saying it. She came off as very Stepford wifey, very like... Her tone and intonation was very studied. We wouldn't allow this in a third world country. It was just like, why why the theatrics? And she had a kitchen behind her. And you know what it did? It. We talk about this a lot on, on Dennis and Julie, which is every Sunday at 1 o'clock Pacific, 4 o'clock Eastern. <laughs> Got to remind people. But we talk about this on Dennis and Julie. But I often say, I don't like when people on the right fulfill the stereotype that the left has of us. And if you look at Katie Britt, again, her tone, her intonation, the fact that she was sitting in a kitchen, it just came off as, again, Stepford wifey, a little creepy, and it fulfilled the left stereotypes that, you know, were these weirdos, essentially, on the right. And, and I'm, not, I'm not crazy about that. Yeah. I loved the way that... Uh... Sarah Huckabee Sanders looked the year before, and I think they should let her do it. I don't know why they change people every year. I don't year. remember Sarah that. Sarah Huckabee Sanders was good. She was awesome. Uh, and, and the other thing I think is they spend a lot of time uh, attacking Brit, and it's like then we don't have to pay attention to the uh, poop show that was the, the State of the Union. Oh, absolutely. We don't have to talk about how terrible that was. Absolutely. Oof. Well, you know what wasn't terrible? RFK Jr.'s State of the Union. Seem to have achieved its promise as an exemplary nation. Modern democracy had spread from one nation, ours, in 1776, to six by 1865, and to 190 by the 1960s. We had become the city on the hill. We were a moral authority around the globe. Our government, institutions, our Congress, the court, the regulatory agencies, and even the American press were renowned for their integrity and they were revered worldwide. Other nations wanted our American leadership. They knew the difference between leadership and bullying, which is something our current leaders seem to have forgotten. We were the template of liberty, proof that for a country to thrive, its people must be free. Free to speak, free to worship, free to build great companies, free to start small businesses. We were the freest country in the world and by no coincidence also the most prosperous. Working Americans could provide for their families on a single salary. They could buy a home, raise a family, save for retirement without mountains of debt. We made the best music, we made the best movies, we made gold standard automobiles that everybody in the world wanted. We made blue jeans, we reconstructed Europe, we put men on the moon. We are the world's healthiest, best educated children. Our productivity, ingenuity, our can-do spirit were the envy of the world. We had confidence in our strength, our capacity, and the limitless potential of our country. So that was the first part of his State of the Union. You can go on YouTube and you can watch it. It was RFK Jr.'s version of the State of the Union. And that's where he was talking about, as you could see, the dynamism and the growth and the strength of the America that he grew up in. And watching that is just so inspiring. I mean, it's true. We had the best educated children. They were strong. We were we were a manufacturing powerhouse. We were be the beacon of you know liberty and hope around the world. And then here's the second part, of course, highlights of, of his talk where he talks about how that's gone all downhill. We've lost far more of our young people to drugs in the last decade and in the 20-year Vietnam War. We've wow. printed nine centuries worth of money in a little over a decade and spent $8 trillion on regime change wars. 
those wars have made America less safe, our country less strong, and the world far less stable. While sending prices through the roof as our infrastructure falls apart, tens of millions of young Americans no longer even dream of owning their own home. What happened to America, the land of opportunity, where you could be sure that if you worked hard and played by the rules, that you would have a decent life? Yes. Too many Americans are living bleak and hopeless lives, dreading the one medical emergency or the car repair that will tip them over the edge into homelessness. We rank 40th globally in our people's health and wellness out of the richest countries in the world, the United States is 35th in child poverty rates, just above Mexico. We rank 36th in literacy and 45th in press freedom. We have one of the highest cancer rates in the world, and our life expectancy now ranks 59th, according to the World Bank. That's right behind Algeria. I just learned more about the history of our country and the current state of our country in those, what, three minutes than I did from... President Biden's entire rambling, nonsensical, incredibly divisive State of the Union. I really like RFK Jr. I've done I've done you know clips on him, Julie Noted's, which which everyone should check out. But it's really interesting to see the comments on my Julie Noted about RFK Jr. and the comments on that video. There are a lot of Americans who are really behind him. I think that that he may uh, he may be more of a um, strong candidate than people may give him credit for. He may have more sway in this election than than people think. What do you think, Sean, watching that? Are you a fan of his? Well, that's certainly How a can well you put argue together with video. Anything. I mean, he can read a teleprompter better than Lunch Bucket Joe. <laughs> that's for sure. Look, he has his downsides. I mean, in that video, he also, uh, I didn't show the part, but he referred to illegal immigrants as undocumented immigrants. You know, there are some things where he seems a little woke, but... It's just so nice to see a former Democrat, now independent, saying common sense things. And I will support any candidate who does stuff like that. So please do uh, check out his full State of the Union. It's like 13 minutes. It's it's really good. So before we get go on to the big news stories, I want to tell you a story about something that happened to me this weekend that made a very big impression on me. Dennis, or Sean, I just called you Dennis. Congratulations. Wow, that's quite an upgrade. <laughs> well, at least I didn't call you Scott, as uh, Dennis called you at the end of his, uh, his, year, his year-end show, right? When he was thanking you for the year. Thank you, Scott McConnell. But Sean, you often say that, you know, Dennis will have an interaction in the elevator and then go and talk about it on the air. I feel like I'm doing uh, a bit of a similar thing, but this was an interaction I had in an Uber ride this past weekend. So I had a friend in town and we went out on Saturday night in West Hollywood for dinner and we called an Uber home at about 10.30 p.m. And we get in the Uber and it's a female Uber driver. We're five, 10 minutes into the ride. And this Uber driver turns around and says, can I ask you girls something that's been on my mind for the past few hours and I, I need some advice about it? Now you usually you go, uh, uh, you could let me off here and I'll call another Uber. But uh, she seemed, you know, she seemed chill. So we said, sure. And she said, well, I did a ride earlier tonight, like two hours before, so around 8, 8.30 p.m. on Saturday. And she said, it was these three guys and one blonde girl. And I took them to this random address in Beverly Hills. And she said, the girl in the back seat looked to me like she was unconscious. And again, she was with these three guys and the Uber driver said, you know, I, I asked the guys, you know, what's going on? Is the girl OK? And apparently the guys said to her, oh, yeah, she's just tired. But then the Uber driver said to us that this girl had her head against the window and she said she didn't look tired. She looked unconscious. But the guys, you know, insisted that that she was tired. They were calling people like you got to, you know, come to this address or this party, whatever. And so this Uber driver is telling us what should what should I have done? I didn't, I didn't quite know what to do. She took a screenshot of the address in Beverly Hills, but she said, I've just been thinking about it for a, f a few hours and I, and I don't know what to do. And, you know, we, we cut in and we said, well, it doesn't quite make sense that someone would be so tired on a 
you know, Saturday night at 8 p.m. where she can't, you know, speak up. Maybe she was asleep, but it didn't, the Uber driver maintained it didn't look like she was asleep. It looked like she was unconscious. So anyway, my friend and I encouraged this Uber driver to call the police. She did on in the car with us. She called the police and she gave uh, the police the address. But what made an impression on me is that this Uber driver in telling us this story said, it just didn't feel right to me. There was something off. But then at the same time, this Uber driver was saying, but I didn't do anything because maybe this blonde girl was just tired or maybe one of the guys with her was her boyfriend. But then the, the driver kept going, no, but it, it just, it didn't feel right to me. So I'm going to pause there. And then I'm going to tell you quickly about another conversation I had with a friend because there's a link. Recently, I was on the phone with, with one of my best friends who's very, uh, God bless her, she's very open-minded, sometimes too open-minded, but very open-minded. And we were talking about kids who don't feel like their gender in this big push of so-called gender-affirming care. And this friend said to me, you know, Julie, I agree with you that, you know, it's probably too young at 13 or 14 to give a child puberty blockers. But this friend said to me, what if a 13 year old is so miserable? And what if they so don't feel right in their bodies? And the one thing that would make that 13 year old less miserable is if they were called by a different name or different pronouns, or if they were given puberty blockers, why would we deny them that? And so as I was in this Uber with this woman who was saying to me, I didn't call the police with this unconscious girl because although it didn't feel right to me, I, you know, didn't want to be wrong in case the situation was benign. I thought of my conversation with my friend about gender affirming care and I saw a link, which is that we have lost our moral gut as a society. We have lost it. This to me is the consequence of consider all sides culture just going too far. We have so much moral policing and so many people go, well, what if, what if a child really is miserable? And what if there is an exception? And what if we need to affirm their gender? Oh, what if the, you know, person in the, the Uber was really just tired and it was so innocuous. We have all these voices in our head because of this intense moral policing culture that we live in, that we kind of have moral paralysis as a result. We're so afraid of saying or doing something wrong that we forget to do what is right. You know, we, and this is what I said to the Uber driver, hope, hopefully kindly, you know, I said, you know, with all due respect, you need to trust your moral gut. You kept saying over and over that you felt like it was wrong. It didn't make sense that a blonde girl would be in an Uber with these three guys. She's looks passed out. It's a Saturday night at 8 PM. She can't speak for herself. You knew that that didn't feel right. You've got to tr trust your gut. Just as when I was talking with my friend about this gender affirming care thing, I said, wait a minute, we can sit here and, you know, go through every possible exception. We can, you know, do a cross section, multiple checked statistical analysis of, you know, if the situation is right. We have to go back to our impulses and our gut as human beings. And we know on a visceral level that giving puberty blockers to a 13 year old is wrong. Just as we know on a visceral level that a girl passed out in the back seat is probably in a bad situation, but we've lost that sense. So anyway, that's, that's something I wanted to bring up. Yep. <laughs> I'm like calling on him. Like a, we're in school. Yes, Sean. Polarization is paralyzation. Yes. Well, yeah, that's what we have. We, we, we're morally paralyzed. And, and another thing, too, with this is <laughs> my friend and I ended up going home and having a huge discussion about good and evil and morality and human nature and social policing. And I'm like, we should have recorded this and made it into a, a, a timeless episode. But, you know, it was interesting because this, this Uber driver, with, with respect to her, she was telling herself that that girl in the back seat was probably okay to make herself feel better, you know? 
And that's what all of us do. It really is an, an interesting view in human nature. And I'm not trying to wag the finger at this Uber driver. I do think she should have called the police immediately. She did call the police once we got, you know, in the car with her and, and told her to. But we all as human beings overlook evil and explain away evil to ourselves really so that we can sleep better at night. You know, I often find this with with homeless people here in Los Angeles. Our city is te teeming with uh, with people who, who don't have homes. And I see them when I get off the freeway exit, you know, these these mothers with children and they're holding up signs, you know, please help me. I'm down on my luck. Or you see, you know, all these different people. I mean, I was walking into CVS the other day and there was a guy who was completely passed out in the entrance of CVS. And it's just I think all of us kind of tell ourselves, well, I couldn't really help them anyway. Well, you know, they, they probably already got money or food earlier that day. Somebody already helped them. A shelter is probably coming to pick them up. Maybe they're a criminal. And maybe if I approach them and ask them if they needed water, or if they needed a sandwich, they would hit. You know, we tell ourselves these things to make ourselves feel better and avoid doing the hard moral work that it takes to make society better. I had the lovely occasion of having to drive through downtown LA this weekend. Oh, it's a war zone. I, I was actually, at, in some parts, it was cleaner than I expected. I saw a homeless guy in a three-piece suit. <laughs> really? How, how did you know he was homeless? <laughs> Maybe he was just a guy in a three-piece suit. Because well, he was sitting next to a tarp. I just... I know what you're saying, though, and there's a couple reasons people don't do it. A, they, they don't have the time. They don't want to deal with it. They, they, uh, maybe they helped one guy. They can't help three. You can't help everybody. There's a lot of reasons to not do the, the right moral thing. And also, there's, there's victims everywhere. Like, it, there's more victims now than there ever have been. You would, you would be broke and exhausted if you tried to help everybody. No, of course. But, but here's where I'm talking about paralysis. We can't also use that as an excuse to not help anybody. Because it's very easy to fall into this mindset of like, well, you know, this homeless person, there are 30,000 other homeless people all around. And there's probably a victim of, you know, domestic abuse five feet from me. And there's probably the, like, but then we don't end up helping anybody. And so it's, again, just that, that whole Uber ride opened up so many avenues of mental exploration for me about the way that we deal with evil and really the stories that we just tell ourselves to, to, to make ourselves feel better. But the final thing I'll say on this, although, trust me, I really could go on about all the, the different revelations, is that it's just amazing to me that we live in this time of intense moral hubris. We think in 2024 that we are the most morally enlightened people to ever grace God's green earth. And we look back on, you know, people who owned slaves with scorn, as we should. We, we shouldn't, you know, s celebrate the, those actions of those individuals. But we look back on them as being such moral simpletons compared to us. And frankly, I just think that's BS. I don't think that we are that much better than some of the people who created or who were uh, who promulgated the greatest moral atrocities of our time. Because look, I mean, talk about gender affirming care. Look at what many people support here in the United States, taking a 13 year old and chopping their breasts off and giving them puberty blockers in the name of this sick ideology. Now, some people would say that's not as bad as slavery. I'm not trying to make a, you know, it, it's, it's a useless road to go down to compare that to slavery. The greater point I'm making, though, is that we engage in immoral actions all of the time, and then we think that we're just somehow morally superior to people in the past. I think all of us would, would be better people and we'd be a better society if we actually understood our human nature and realized that we're not so much better than those people. You got, you got, you got a reaction? It's okay if you don't. No, you go, girl. I always, I always want to give you space <laughs> to tell no, me your I thoughts. Don't want, when you're on a roll, why should I talk? No, it's fine. I'm, I don't need you to talk. But do let me know if the chat has anything to say about it. And, of course, you can call in 844-861-5537, 844-861-5537. Okay. So, speaking of the State of the Union, which we referenced a few minutes ago, <laughs> 
I'm sure some of you have seen that President Biden has been on somewhat of an apology tour for something that he said during the State of the Union. And no, it wasn't when he admonished the Supreme Court for doing their job, or it wasn't when he asked Republicans what rights they were going to take away from Americans next, or no, it wasn't all of the lies that he promulgated that America's stronger than ever and we're making the greatest comeback in human history. He wasn't apologizing for any of that. He was apologizing for calling Lakin Riley's murderer an illegal. Let's watch a clip of him on MSNBC apologizing for this grave offense. I noticed the look of surprise on your face when you walked into the chamber and you saw Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, it was priceless. You feigned shock at, at seeing her. But during your response to her heckling of you, you used the word illegal when talking about the man who allegedly killed um, uh, Lakin Riley. An undocumented person. And I shouldn't <laughs> have used illegal, I should have, it's undocumented. And look, when I spoke about the difference between Trump and me, one of the things I talked about on the border was that his, the way he talks about vermin, the way he talks about these people polluting the blood. I talked about what I'm not gonna do, what I won't do. I'm not gonna treat any, any, any of these people with disrespect. Look, they built the country. The reason our economy is growing, we have to control the border and, and more orderly flow, but I, I don't share his view at all. So you, you regret using that word? Yes. <laughs> you, my favorite part of that clip is the big pie eating smile he has when he thinks he's cool. And then the guy hits him with, oh, you're coming at me. Watch his facial expression <laughs> change and then try to blame it on Trump somehow. <sighs> you know, uh, there's so much to say about this video. It's sort of like the whole Claudine Gay scandal at Harvard. It just revealed so much about the rot of higher education that someone who, you know, plagiarized could ascend to such a high level in academia. You know, pro when she went and testified before Congress about the calling for genocide of the Jews, questions of free speech on campus, like the Claudine Gay scandal was like a micro, like, cosm of all that was wrong with higher education. That one clip we could spend showing all the things that are wrong with our culture, our media, the president of the United States. So much to say, but it really does reveal a lot about the media, MSNBC, that they would ask that question. And it also reveals a great deal about President Biden, the way that he answered that question. Because he, what that shows is that both the media and the president of the United States are more concerned with apologizing to a murderer who is not a citizen of this country than to the victim who is a citizen of this country. That's messed up. The way President Biden should have answered it said, wait a minute, wait a minute. First of all, he is illegal. Second of all, there is one person who we need to be focusing on. There is one name that needs to be said, and it is Lincoln. Sorry, Lakin Riley. Did you hear when he said Lincoln Riley at the speech? Oh, my gosh. You know, he should go, wait a minute. Let's stop with this nonsense. We need to focus on this individual and this victim. And not. Oh, you do? Okay, let's see it. Yeah, let's let's watch. It's not about him. It's not about me. I'd be a winner. And then next will be the one where he's at the airport. I... God, he looks like a deer in the headlights. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed. Look at Kamala. By an illegal. That's right. But how many of thousands of people being killed by illegals? To her parents, I say, my heart goes out to you, having lost children myself. I understand. But look, if we change the dynamic at the border, people pay people, people pay these smugglers 8,000 bucks to get across the border, because they know if they get by, if they get by and let into the country, it's six to eight years before they have a hearing. And it's worth the, taking the chance of the 8,000 dollars. But, but, if it's only six months, six weeks, the idea is it's highly unlikely that people All right. pay that money. I literally, I can't even watch it anymore. It, it, we saw what we needed to see. L Lincoln Riley. You know, I, I just want to say for a minute, the fact that he apologized on MSNBC for calling this person illegal 
And then he goes, oh, undocumented. Let's let's really look at that language here. You know, this is another left wing lie that all of us just kind of consume because it's repeated enough. And that is that it's somehow offensive and vilifying an immigrant to call them an illegal immigrant, because that's what President Biden said in in that clip. He said, you know, I'm not like my predecessor who who says all these horrible things about immigrants. You know, I'm different than that, which is why I'm calling them undocumented. But no one really asks the question, why is it offensive to call an illegal immigrant an illegal immigrant? The irony is they're actually documented. It's not that they're undocumented. We know that, you know, the DHS and other government entities have have the numbers on on many of these individuals. They are documented as coming into the country. But but calling them illegal immigrants, that is an accurate statement of what is going on. They are illegally immigrating to the United States. That doesn't mean you don't have sympathy for many of them. That doesn't mean that you don't understand the situation that many of them in are, are in. Excuse me. I mean, I say on this show all of the time, I can understand how people fleeing war-torn, poverty-stricken countries are desperate to give themselves and their kids a better life. I love America. I know how great America is. And I get many of these people are just trying to survive. But calling them illegal immigrants doesn't negate any of that. It's not insulting. It's just it's just an accurate description of what's going on. But but the point is no one questions that. We just swallow these left-wing lies. Yes, calling someone an illegal immigrant is so offensive, but no one even questions that assumption. It doesn't make sense. They caught him on the tarmac the next day. You got to listen to what oh, he okay. says. Okay, let's see. Do you regret using the word illegal to describe immigrants last night, sir? Well, not probably. I don't regret it. Technically, not supposed to be here. Technically, technically not supposed to be here. Yeah. I think they... that's what we should call them from now on. Not supposed to be here. Technically not (laughs) supposed. Well, you know what? That's another revelatory interaction because what it shows is that the president of the United States, and frankly, I'm sorry, but the entire Democratic Party seems to care more about foreign nationals than they do about citizens of this country. Look at even how much attention is given to this, that people are more outraged by the president of the United States calling an illegal immigrant murderer an illegal than they are outraged by his despicable policies, which made this murder of an American girl possible. That is moral confusion. That is messed up. And it's showing that there is, there's far more importance and attention placed on people who are not citizens. And you can't help but, but wonder if the president of the United States really views himself as serving Americans or serving people primarily who are not Americans. Even look, by the way, look at how the State of the Union started the other night. Do you remember what it started with? Not fentanyl not the border crisis, not our decrepit public schools, not the insane and terribly harmful cash bail and policing policies, not issues that have to do with Americans. It started with Ukraine. The State of the Union started with Ukraine because the focus is not on Americans anymore in this country. It's focused on people, many thousands of miles away from us, people who are not citizens of this country, giving them prepaid debit cards, giving them hotel rooms. The focus is not on Americans. I interviewed Tulsi Gabbard recently on uh, Dennis's show when I guest hosted for her. You can watch it, uh, Julie Noted clip. And she, I asked her about the, the victims of the Maui wildfires about a year ago, eight months ago, those terrible fires in Maui left people homeless, you know, many hundreds of people were dead. And that community is still reeling from that loss. So I asked Miss Gabbard, you know, how are people on Maui doing? And you know what she said to me? She said there has been barely any assistance from the federal government given to these individuals. And she said that many of those people on Maui say to her, If we lived in Kiev instead of in Maui, then maybe our president would care about us. It's a huge statement. But, you know, but again, we we have to question these assumptions. Please identify for me. And I'm, I'm very willing to hear the argument. How is calling an illegal immigrant an illegal immigrant offensive? How is that vilifying immigrants? It doesn't make sense. 
And I used to call un- illegal immigrants undocumented immigrants, really, just because I heard it so often in schools. Like, I just kind of accepted that as, as the term. But now I make a concerted effort to not use the term undocumented and instead use the term illegal because I believe it's really important for us to be precise in our language. We have a lot of this smoke and mirror stuff in society to, you know, distract us from what's really going on. Calling an undocumented immigrant undocumented documented instead of illegal is one of those examples. You're trying to shift the attention away from from the fact that they're here illegally and instead call them undocumented. Gender affirming care is another example. You know, it's like smoke and mirrors to hide what's really going on, which is not gender affirmation. It's gender denial and it's not care. It's abuse. So we, we have so many of these examples that in every single day in my language, I am just trying to be more precise. Because a healthy society rests on truth, and truth is promulgated through precise language. So, speaking, oh, oh, you want to cut in? Amen, amen. No, I just, I, I think you just made a brilliant point. It's important to pause and let that soak in just a little bit. I don't know if there's ever been a society that, that strived for the truth that you seek, but we would all be better off if that were the case. And I think in honor of Joe, we should call them technically not supposed to be here. Oh my gosh. It's so insulting. <laughs> it, 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 is, it, it, it shows you that this guy doesn't have any moral backbone. I mean, we already knew that. But the fact that he's on MSNBC one day, you know, saying, oh, yeah, I'm, I, I do apologize for using the term, you know, illegal. Uh, it should have been undocumented. And then the next day on the tarmac, he's asked the same question and he says, no, I, I don't really apologize for that. You know, like he he just flips. It's, it's the other way around. The tarmac happened first. Oh, we I see. We played them in oh, reverse order. Well, and whatever. Then when he had more time to think about it, it became Donald Trump's fault. Right. Of course. Everything is right. He stubs his toe. Donald Trump put the, put the door there for me to stub my toe. But but you know, th- thank you for pausing me because this this point about precise language, you know, we see, and I I have done whole segments on this. We see how this is not just leading to harm on a kind of interpersonal level. The distortion and hijacking and lack of precision in language is leading to immense harm in our laws, in our system of government. In Illinois, for instance, they are trying to amend the Abused and Neglected Child Act to say that an abused child is one whose parents don't give them gender-affirming care. That is a total distortion of what the term abused A, means, and B, was intended to mean in the law. So now, if that bill does become law, if it passes in you know, both chambers of, of Congress in Illinois and it's signed by the governor, it means that a child can be taken away from his or her parents if their parents do not affirm their gender. That's not what abu- an abused child statute and procedures were meant to do. They were meant to take children away who were being beaten and you know viciously harassed by their parents. I'll I'll give you another example here in California. They now say it's discrimination, a violation of civil rights law to not have a gender neutral toy section in a department store, because now you can just take these words and twist them to mean whatever they want. So that's why I'm very, very, very careful to use illegal immigrant in every single thing we do. We have to endeavor for this kind of precision. So before we go on to maybe one of the most disturbing stories you will hear about uh, these four people on Long Island chopping up bodies and dispersing them and not having to be held in jail, let me tell you about something light, which is my pillow. I use a lot of my pillow products. I sleep on a my pillow. I use the Giza Dream bed sheets. I wear my slippers, which are so great and comfortable. And you can get all of these products at an immense discount if you go to mypillow.com or call 1 800 566 6745 and use the promo code Hartman. I mentioned that I sleep on the Giza Dream bed sheets. You can get a queen size set for $59.98 and a king size for just $69.98, which are the lowest prices in history. You can also get 60% off of the original My Slippers. I wear them every single day. They are so comfortable. Go to mypillow.com or call 1 800 566 
866-6745 and use the promo code Hartman. Again, you can also get the Dream Sheets, Queen Size for $59.98, King Size for $69.98. Call 1-800-566-6745 or go to MyPillow.com and use the promo code Hartman. Shall I look quickly at the chat? I'm always yeah, go so ahead. Sure. Census count. Oh my God, it's AP unfiltered. Wow. Hello, AP unfiltered. Oh yeah, he's saying allegedly. Yes, that's a, that's a good point. When they're talking about Lake and Riley's murderer, they say you know the person who allegedly murdered Lake and Riley. Now look, I I actually don't mind that because at this point this person has not been convicted. But here's what bothers me. Did they say that Derek Chauvin allegedly killed George Floyd? That would have been the proper language before his conviction. In other words, if you want to across the board use allegedly when people have you know committed crimes, I'm okay with that. But the problem is they selectively use it to kind of cushion the blow, if you will, when it's an illegal immigrant. But then with people they don't like, they don't use the term allegedly. So thank you. AP Unfiltered, which everybody should check out. Aaron Prager, uh, his fantastic uh, YouTube channel podcast. Check it out. Yep, Sir TDS, Chuck Schumer, quote, illegal immigration is wrong, plain and simple. Yep. Oh, Tessa Jane, I use the men's my pillows because I like bigger ones. I didn't know they had male I didn't know they, pillows. yeah. Well, you know what? Good for them. They think there are only two genders. That's nice. <laughs> I, no, I have the non-binary pillow. It's just I'm that. sure you do misinformation, but oh my God, we still have you as misinformation. That is so funny. And we had a caller call in and go, hi, Julian, misinformation. Remember that? <laughs> that was great. You know, it's not great though. This next story, this is crazy. Okay. So according to the New York Post, a few weeks ago, there were these four people, two men and two women in their 30s and 40s who were charged with hiding chopped up pieces of two bodies and scattering them around Long Island. Now, call me crazy, but if these individuals are chopping up and hiding and dispersing body parts, it's probably also likely that those people allegedly murdered those, those two individuals. But remarkably, they have not been charged with murder and the thing that they have been charged for, which is, you know, mutilating and disposing a murdered person's corpse, they don't have to be held on bail for in the state of New York. OK, so again, let's just look more closely at the details of the story. By the way, this is according to The New York Post, because I'm not Claudine Gay. I cite my sources and I use accurate quotes when I am quoting from a news source. Ding. Julie Hartman, not gay. So these four people, and there were two men, two women, and three of them were roommates, weirdly, and then one of them was a homeless person. It's also interesting. You want to figure out how did they know each other? How did, how did the homeless person know the roommates? How did they know the people who were murdered? This whole story, it just the more you look into it, it's just weird on weird on weird. So these four people had... Ready for this quote, body parts, meat cleavers, butcher knives, and a significant amount of blood in their home. So I mentioned three of them were roommates. There was so much blood and mutilation and hacking devices in their homes that they tried to discard of that their toilets, sinks, and showers stopped working because they were clogged with all of the blood in the flesh. Okay. So basically the point is these people are sick criminals beyond belief. They dispersed these body parts of these, these two people, one man, one woman, and they were discovered by a little girl walking to school with her friends in on Long Island. This little girl just happened upon a severed arm, just hanging out in the middle of where she was walking and she reported it to police and then they found all of these other scattered body parts. Welcome to Joe Biden's America, everybody. Welcome to the left's America. Your little girl walking to school, you don't know what she could encounter. A homeless person could start hacking away at her. She could find a, a dismembered arm. You, you just, you know, 
Who this knows? Is a, this is a good reason not to help the homeless. <laughs> Be careful. And uh, I think it's pronounced Long Island. They like, they run it together. Sometimes I, I really wonder. I really wonder. Long Island. Thank you. L yeah, you're welcome. What was the please, other one? no, continue with the toilets and the sinks stopped up with blood, please. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so nice, right? Okay, so here, here's the kicker. Haven't been charged with murder yet. Crazy. They have been charged with, quote, according to the New York Post, hindering prosecution, concealment of a human cor a corpse, and tampering with physical evidence. But none have been accused of murder, according to the Suffolk police. Okay. Oh, my God. Wow. So that's, you know, whammy number one. The double whammy is that the things that they have been, you know, charged with, that is concealment of a human corpse and mutilating a body, are not bail eligible under New York cash bail reform laws. So these individuals have all pled not guilty and they have been released with ankle monitors. So the, they're, they're out. They have ankle monitors, but they're out. Okay, this is quoting from Suffolk County DA uh, Ray Turney. He said, quote, this is yet another absurd, absurd result thanks to bail reform and a system where the legislature in Albany substitutes their judgment for the judgment of our judges and the litigants in court. And he laments the fact that his uh, his prosecutors can't ask for cash bail because those crimes are not eligible for cash bail under the state, uh, the state laws. Okay. Meanwhile, by the way. Six pro-lifers have been charged with 10 and a half years, I repeat, 10 and a half years in prison for nonviolently trespassing on an abortion clinic to, you know, sing hymns, recite prayers, and urge people not to kill a child. They're getting 10 and a half years, but the chopped up body parts people, ankle bracelets, they're out, not even charged with murder, okay? So there's that in Long Island. <laughs> Let's go over to Worcester, Massachusetts, where, by the way, my mother is from. I have been to Worcester many times. It is the second most visited place that I have been to to see my grandparents, my cousins outside of uh, here in Los Angeles. So your your mother's from Worcester? No. Oh, God, if she's watching, she's going to hate you. Wor she, she hates when people say that. The only reason I jumped in is because my mother's from Lo Long Island. Oh, really? Yeah, this is strange. This is very strange. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's look at Worcester. So about a week ago, there was a mother and an 11 year old daughter in the passenger or the, the driver's seat and the passenger seat respectively of a car parked in Worcester. I know exactly where the street is. I know exactly where this happened, not far away from where my mother grew up. And they were in broad daylight, the, the beginning of this month, shot to death multiple times at 3 p.m. in the afternoon by these two men. 27 year old and 28 year old. Great, right? So one of them, the 28 year old has been arrested, but the other one, a 27 year old is still out on the loose. And because we live in crazy left-wing America, let's look at the news story and how they described this individual who is literally like being hunted for right now. There is a manhunt with a $5,000 reward. I checked just about two minutes before I went live. They have not found him yet. It's been over a week. But let's look at how 10 Boston, the news agency, reported this. They said, quote, police said he should be considered armed and dangerous. He is described as being about 5'11 tall and 160 pounds. He's wanted on charges of armed assault with intent to murder and possession of a firearm without license. So they describe him as being 5'11 and 160 pounds. Do you notice anything about that description? Do you notice either something that's present or something that is missing? I do. You do? I saw the picture on the screen. Yeah. He's black. Right. Do you think that's a relevant detail if you're trying to find someone? You're manhunting? No, no. I, I just, I go strictly by height. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Left-wing America, everybody. Okay. Oh, also, just, you know, another point on this story about left-wing America. It's not the first time that these two individuals have been, 
you know, engaged in some less than noble activity, but somehow they're allowed back out on the streets. This is reading from Boston 10, and they are citing the Worcester Telegram and Gazette that these two individuals have, quote, spent time in jail and have links to gangs. Mangual, who was the one who was arrested, was sentenced to three to five years in prison following a shooting in 2014. He also has open cases for assault and battery on a police officer and drug possession. The other one, Balnavis, who is out on the loose, but we can't say his race as we're looking for him, right? Terrible to say his race. Well, let's look at what he's done. He, quote, has a lengthy criminal record. He's faced charges that include strangulation, resisting arrest, breaking and entering, and assault with a dangerous weapon. But they're allowed back out on the street to murder this mother and her 11-year-old daughter in broad daylight in Worcester, Massachusetts, okay? Let me tell you a third thing. This is all just in the past two weeks. More examples of crazy left-wing America. How about what happened on the New York City subway? Things have gotten so bad in Manhattan that the governor, Kathy Hochul of uh, the state of New York, has ordered 750 National Guard members, 250 New York State police, as well as many MTA officers to the subway stations to patrol and do bag checks. They are doing bag checks uh, covering about a third of the subway system because people have been assaulted. They have had their, their possession stolen. There have been people pushed in front of the subway station. My friend was about to get on the subway and the and um, the, it was blocked off because the someone at his stop was pushed onto uh, the tracks. Just a lot of great stuff going on, you know, in these Democrat-run uh, states and cities. The New York Police Department chief of patrol gave a quote, to uh, the New York Post about this. And he said, quote, what we really want judges to do is take really bad recidivists, i.e. people who commit crimes multiple times, off the street after we do our job. The DA does their job and the judges do their job. That's what we want. You take care of those recidivists and crime will plummet in the city and the city will prosper. Yeah, arrest the bad guys put the bad guys in jail when they do bad things and maybe you won't be seeing people getting hacked and uh, their body parts being dispersed. You probably won't see, you know, people who have been arrested for strangulation going out and killing a mother and a daughter and you probably won't have the need to deploy nearly a thousand members of the National Guard just to keep public transit from being a murderous underground mental asylum. But as we talked about, Shanzi, at the beginning of the show, there are no limits, right, that the left can go to. They can do the craziest stuff. Their cities can fall apart. You can have a girl walking to school with an arm, a severed arm, right in front of her, and those perpetrators are out released. They can do all of that, and people still vote Democrat, and crucially, our American elite in this country don't view it at all as an indictment on the left. But then Senator Katie Britt got a detail wrong in her rebuttal, which she should not have gotten wrong, but she got a detail wrong, and it's a whole referendum on conservatism. By the way, there's a clip I have, if, if we can play it. Jimmy Kimmel, hosting the Oscars last night, of course took a swipe at her. Emma played an adult woman with the brain of a child, like the lady who gave the rebuttal to the State of the Union on Thursday night. And... So Joe Biden can give the worst State of the Union known to man and God. Nothing, right? No problem. But then Katie Britt gets one detail wrong and everyone is, you know, cackling like she's she's the one with the the brain of a child so this whole idea fascinates me it's like how is this the case that that the left can be so irrational irresponsible and destructive and it's not an indictment on them to many americans but then if the right does one thing wrong the entirety of conservatism is defunct why is that i have a theory do you have a theory 
Why, why is it that literally you can have kids barking? I mean, again, this is not just like their policies are bad. This is, you can have people go nuts because of left-wing ideology. You can have kids at schools who are on all fours, like licking the ground, barking, getting their water out. Have you read these stories? Getting their water out of like a, a cat cup because they think they're animals. Yes, they're identifying as animals. You can go walk on the street and have human defecation on the street. And and the media, the establishment, no one cares. They don't view that at all as an indictment of the left. But again, Katie Britt gets one detail wrong and, and everyone is in you know hysterics about it. Why is that? It's an excellent question. No, but seriously, do you do you have a, a, a theory? I have I have many theories. Look, the, the 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 left has been very effective in hijacking the language. They've been very effective in the use of social media and Hollywood and education uh, to get into the brains of young people and skew them in a direction. They they. Uh, it's not only that, that they had no problem with the way Biden delivered the State of the Union, but they praised him and said that he was so feisty yeah. and full of vigor. And I, I, I feel like I watched the same thing, and I didn't see that at all. I saw a man that was angry and lost and lying and bad at reading a teleprompter. And that's another thing I don't like about the, the decorum at the State of the Union, not to change the subject, but the constant standing up and applauding every five seconds and the, uh, the hollering out from either side, it's just awful. It's not a good look. Well, speaking of decorum, I, I, there, there's an article in the Wall Street Journal opinion section about how Supreme Court justices should not go to the State of the Union. Because remember, Biden was like, you you guys, you know, you overturn Roe v. Wade, you're going to see how much political power women have. It's like they're doing their job. They are doing what's yeah. in accordance with the Constitution to bring this issue back to the states. Anyway, I agree with you that the that the State of the Union has become a zoo. But check out that article; it's a good article. But, but th this question, this is a really, really important question, if I do say so myself, that we're that we're coming to here because it's like we've got to figure out why this is going on, why there can be no limits to the left's destruction, but then on the right it is judged so harshly. How has this been allowed to happen? Because look, maybe maybe the human race is not the smartest, you know, of God's creatures, but I don't think we're that stupid. You know, I, I really don't. There's something else going on. And what I think it is, it's sort of what you alluded to earlier, Sean, is that there has been such a massive campaign, not just a propaganda campaign to you know, show people selective news stories or hide information. I actually don't think it's that. There has been a massive campaign to change the way that we think, to change the way that we process information. And that is hard because I will talk with people who are, you know, hardcore Democrats and I will go through lists and lists of terrible things, terrible Democrat policies, debunking their lies. I mean, I could literally do a a whole lecture series replete with all kinds of proof to disprove their point and they still will not get it or they still will not see it as an indictment on the left. And that indicates that there has been a literal rewiring of our brains. Because now, and Dennis talks about this all the time, your positions on things are viewed as more important than your actions. As long as someone recites the right line, says the right thing, it doesn't matter if on, their gr on the ground their policies are killing people. As long as the, you know, these DAs get up and go, we need to combat you know, racial discrimination and change all of these policing and cash bail policies, no one cares that there are dead corpses on the street as a result of that person's policies, as long as that person is mouthing the right platitudes. We even see this with Dennis, right? Dennis is under fire constantly for opposing uh, redefining marriage in 2015. He did not want to, uh, you know, vote for or did not want uh, the Supreme Court to uh, pass a Burgefell versus Hodges, which is which, you know, allows gays the, the right to marry because he didn't want to change the definition of marriage. He is excoriated constantly for that, even though 
One of his best friends and board members of PragerU is a gay man, and he's the godfather to a gay couple's child, and he interpersonally is the most lovely person to everyone, including gay people. But no one cares about his actions because his position in their eyes was wrong. It's, it's an amazing campaign, and you know, if there's one thing we give them credit for, they've been massive, massively successful at this. I think it goes back to the, what, what that quote is. Uh, if you're not liberal oh, yes, that in your one. 20s, you don't have a heart. And oh, if yeah. you're not conservative in your 30s, you don't have a brain. In the 60s, everyone rebelled, and there was free love, and everyone thought that was the way to be. And it's natural to want to rebel when you're younger. And I think the 60s was the high water mark of rebellion, and they've been trying to reach that mark ever since, but it just becomes, the rebellion becomes less and less significant as we go on. And now you, you to the point where we had the BLM riots that were just destroying things during COVID while you should have been in your house wearing a mask. Jeez. I, I just, I, I'm trying to answer your question from earlier about how we got to this point. And I think people are starting to wake up. I think you gave the numbers last week that the, the working class is strongly behind Trump that the, this Democrat party that is in Washington is not the Democrat party of 30 years ago. Uh, they, they are- It's not the party of 10 years ring. ago. They're holding on to power, they're clinging to it, they're trying to stay relevant and they're, they're just done and they need to go. And I think Donald Trump is a different version of conservatism than the bad Republicans that were built against, uh, they, priests in the Catholic Church. There were some awful scandals with priests and, and, and molestation and stuff, right? So that the whole church got written off because of some bad priests. Uh, th there's all this kind of stuff where if it happens on the right, like if a religious man has an affair, therefore religion is right. bad, yes. right? But not the individual. Well, well, can I cut in for so a minute? Just The hypocrisy is rich. I just wanted to say that I think, I think people are waking up and, and they may vote for Trump this time around because they can see through the veneer that is this old democratic establishment, which is not the, the liberal so. ideals that used to be. Well, you know, just quickly, what you just said really put a light bulb in my head where you said, you know, if a religious man has an affair, it's an indictment on all of religion and all of religious people, right? And this is my point, that the left can do all this crazy stuff. It's not an indictment on them. People on the right do one thing wrong. It's a referendum on the whole system. You know what it is? This is the cost of having principles. Because on the right, when you have principles, or you know, in, in religion, when, when you are religious, you abide by certain principles. And if you don't live up to them, it is seen as as a as a referendum on your whole system but on the left most of them are not guided by principles so they can be intensely hypocritical and it's not judged the same way because it's not judged against the principles that they are trying to live up to does that make sense yeah it's 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 what shapiro has on his on his coffee mug facts versus feelings it it feels good to do these things on the left in the micro but when he when you expand it to the macro, it, it's not good policy. Right, but and this the hard, point... the hard thing to do is to follow the facts and do what's right in the macro, regardless of what feels good. And so I'm just saying, I think yes. people are waking up to that. Well, there, there again, there, the, the left, not liberals, but leftists in general are not guided by principles. They're not. You can see how hypocritical. You can see, oh, support, defend women, but there's no such thing as a woman. America's systemically racist, but non-white immigrants should come here. You know, like, oh, me too, me too, me too. But when Israeli women are raped by Hamas, they don't care. They are not a, a conglomerate of principles. So that's why they can be intensely hypocritical, because no one is judging them against the principles that they have staked their claim to. Whereas on the right, when people come up short, you can very easily go, well, you're not the person you say you are, because all you do is a Spouse principles, and yet you're not living up to them. Look, Sean, I hope you're right that people are waking up. But, but, but this, this has been a massive rewiring of the brain campaign. And the person that alerted me to this is Yuri Bezmenov. Yuri Bezmenov, are you familiar with him? He's a he's a KGB defector. Well, he's he's dead, but he was a KGB defector, and he he moved to Canada, and he came out and told Americans about this 
four-step plan that the Soviet Union had within a span of 20 to 50 years to ideologically subvert the United States. And he talks about this exactly, where he says that there is this cam campaign to demoralize people. And we hear that term, we think demoralization, we think like, oh, we're sad, you're somber, you're, you don't have hope. There, there's that component. But what he literally meant was demoralize, like take our moral principles and deprogram us from those. And he says that they're, what they endeavored to do was make Americans so morally and mentally confused that they can have all of this information in front of them. They can have all of these proofs that, you know, certain things are wrong and certain things are right. And yet they can't, they can't accept it because they've been, their, their, their brains have been deep fried and scrambled. What he talks about, we are in the midst of. We are two decades into already. We're there. We're there. You see Joe Biden at the bully pulpit talking about how we have to move forward into this great light, and they want to take you into the past. Look, that's why I love that you called the show Timeless. That's why I love what you do. You are focused on facts, and there are things from the past that should be preserved that worked. Change for the sake of change, progressivism for the sake of progressivism is not a good thing. Should we stay stagnant? No. But we need to move forward for the right reasons and preserve the things from the past. And I, that's what we're living in right now, the moral confusion you were talking about, which Yuri Bezmenov talked about. You can present facts to these people and they don't care. They don't even see it. They don't want to see it. They've, look, these, uh, the thing, they have been immensely successful. The left, you know, then the Soviet Union, communist China, all of them have done it. And, and here's here's the kicker, and then we'll move on to Oscar stuff. The kicker is that we know it's happening and we don't care. That is the epitome of demoralization. That's exactly what Yuri Bezmenov outlined. I say this all the time. We know China's spying on us. Like I have friends who use TikTok and I go, you know, they're spying on you through your camera and they're seizing your data and they're the ones in charge of fentanyl, which is killing 100,000 Americans. And they're spying on our military bases and they bought off our leaders and they steal our intellectual property. And like, doesn't this matter to you when you're using TikTok that you're supporting A, an authoritarian regime, which is trying to ruin your country and B, you are an accomplice in your own spying and people don't care people don't care they can do it they don't have to hide it because they know that we are so demoralized doesn't matter anyway speaking of <laughs> demoralization and uh <laughs> we're screwed oh, it's such an important point but you should emphasize demoral so that people don't think it's demoralized but it's well it's both moral it's actually yeah. both yeah, but to both. watch, you should anybody who hasn't seen Yuri Bezmenov talk about, please watch that video. It is so eerie. creepy. Oh, I'll give you another one, and I'm actually doing a show on this. Uh, the the American Communist Party, and there is such a thing. It's called the Democratic Party. <laughs> Uh, the American Communist Party, I think, in the 1940s or 1950s, released this manifesto, and they outlined either 50 or 100, I have it at, have it at home, um, goals that they have for the next 50 to 60 years. You read them and it's like, th this is happening. It's like buy off one, have one political party in the United States doing our bidding, control the media, control the schools, convince people that American values, as Dennis says, the American Trinity, freedom, e pluribus unum, and God we trust are defined. You read all these and you're like, they're just describing America in 2024. This project has been immensely successful. All right, moving on to the Oscars in our last five to 10 minutes. I thought we'd do something a little lighter than demoralization, Yuri Bezmenov, and we're screwed. You know, we all know that these award shows are incredibly woke. And talk about the, the moral hubris that I was discussing earlier. You see these actors and actresses get up and act like they are so enlightened and they're so pompous and glib in their uh, monologues. It's just gross to watch. Let's, let's watch some of that grossness for 30 seconds. Climate change is real. It is happening right now. It is the most urgent threat facing our entire species. I've been thinking a lot about some of the distressing issues that we are facing collectively, whether we're talking about gender inequality or racism or queer rights. We have to vote in 2020 and we have to get beg and plead for everyone we know 
to vote in 2020. Shut up! I've tried my very best to live a life of my own making, and I wouldn't have been able to do this without employing a woman's right to choose. <laughs> right now, we stand here as men who refute their Jewishness and the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation which has led to conflict for so many innocent people. Whether the victims of October the... That last clip that you saw where the guy was talking about Jew his Jewishness and all that, that was from last night's Oscars. But all the other ones were compilations from, from other Oscars. So I am fascinated by this you know, woke infiltration, not just of America, but specifically the Oscars and these award ceremonies and the pomposity of certain celebrities in essentially proselytizing to us or condescending to us that their visions of society are better. And so I've gone back and I've looked at some other key moments in the Oscars, and I want to show two examples to you of just how different things were and how in real cases where people, you know, needed to stand up and combat certain discrimination, they weren't pompous, they weren't glib, they were so refined. It, it really is amazing to watch. This clip that I want to show you is when Hattie McDaniel won Best Supporting Actress in 1940 at the 12th Oscars ceremony. Now, to give you some background, Hattie McDaniel played Mammy in Gone with the Wind, and she was the first black actress to win any award at the Oscars, which is already a huge thing. But also what you're about to see is a venue during which McDaniel had to sit at the back. She was not at the Gone with the Wind table. She was at a back table with her black escort and her white agent who, who did sit with her. But the producer of the movie Gone with the Wind had to ask special permission of the venue the Ambassador's Coconut Grove nightclub to allow McDaniel in because they had a strict no blacks policy, okay? So just, just orient yourself here. Imagine this woman at a back table away from all the white people having special permission to get into this venue in the first place. Watch how she handles getting the award. Isn't that an amazing clip? It may, when I was watching it last night, it made me cry. I mean, her graciousness, her humility, and, and this woman was so viciously discriminated against. In fact, you know, I, I was reading more about her. She, when she died, she wanted to be buried in the Hollywood cemetery, and they said no, because they didn't, they didn't want a black person there. You know, and she, I mean, if there was, oh. if there was anyone who could have gotten up and given an admonishing speech and be, you know. How dare you? And it would have been her. Of course, it, right? It breaks my heart that she wasn't able to sit with everyone else. When you said that, I, I just think about how, how far we've come in this country, how, how wrong that was, and how slow we are to, to get better, to the point that we have Will Smith slapping Chris Rock for talking about his wife. I, I just... The juxtaposition of that just blows my mind. Exactly. Isn't that amazing? Because uh, we, I, I wanted to show those videos in, in tandem because, you know, the first people are victims of nothing, nothing. And they're acting like they are these moral titans and you can just see how highly they think of themselves. And then here we have this woman who was sitting in the back at a segregated table, was so viciously discriminated against, and she comes up and handles herself with grace and humility and graciousness. That is the, that is an example that all of us should endeavor to replicate. You know, that is the person that we should be lionizing as our role models, not these glib Hollywood people who pat themselves on the back for having zero oppression. It's, it's crazy. Well, we're not as strong as we used to be. No, we're the, not. The greatest and the, generation, the, the people that actually experienced Jim Crow or slavery, they were tougher people, and they handled it with more class than we have ever thought of. We're so soft in uh, the way we live now that, that that's what we've become. We are standing that, that we can, on the yeah. foundation that people like Hattie McDaniel built for us, right? And we're oh, stomping yeah. on it and tarnishing that with our glibness and our superciliousness and the way that we try to undermine the great progress that we have made. It's gross. What did I tell you? I told you like six months ago. We stand on the generation, the greatest generation built the structures and buildings that this generation spray paints on. And hacks away at the foundations of. We're, at, we're not just spray painting it. We're literally taking a sledgehammer and trying to 
cut down the whole building. You know, just quickly, I'll tell you, because I went down an internet rabbit hole last night reading about Hattie McDaniel. So that that venue where the Oscars was, the Ambassador's Coconut Grove nightclub, which had this, the strict no blacks policy and the producer of the Gone with the Wind film had to get special permission for Hattie McDaniel to come. It wasn't that that place wasn't desegregated until 1959 when the Unruh Civil Rights Act was passed in California, which outlawed racial discrimination. Guess where the Unruh Civil Rights Act was just used in 2024. That is the law that Governor Gavin Newsom and the California Democrats used to justify mandating that businesses with 500 or more employees have a gender neutral toy section. Talk about spray painting and hacking away at the foundation that people built for us. Talk about the subversion of language. Do you really think the Unruh Civil Rights Act was passed so that a gender neutral toy section could be mandated in a store? Just saying. Okay, another example, finally, of uh, just a different, you know, different era. You know, this this is an example of what some call the opening of the door of wokeism in these award ceremonies. And it was from 1973 when Marlon Brando refused to accept the Oscar for his performance in The Godfather and instead had a Native American named Little Feather come up and refuse the Oscar. Hello, my name is Sasheen Little Feather. I'm representing Marlon Brando this evening. And he has asked me to tell you that he very regretfully cannot accept this very generous award. And the reasons for this being are the treatment of American Indians today by the film industry. She's Excuse booed. me. I beg at this time that I have not intruded upon this evening, and that we will, in the future, our hearts and our understandings will meet with love and generosity. Thank you on behalf of Marlon Brando. By the way, she, she died in 2022, just passage of time. Look at her shortly before she died. This is, a, this is an image of, of Little Feather. Here, here she is, yes. But, you know, look at her speech, okay? Again, some people are thinking it was too woke. It opened the door of wokeism. But it was so gracious, you know? She got up there. She wasn't shouting. She wasn't yelling. She wasn't supercilious. She said that Marlon Brando very regretfully declines this generous award. And then at the end, she said, you know, I, I hope very much that I haven't intruded on this evening. And, and I wish you all the best. Like, that, that's gracious wokeness, you know? That, that, that's even that is just a level of humility that we don't see the woke people who do similar things today they, they they it doesn't even occur to them to have that kind of graciousness they'll yell they'll they'll be angry you know why because because being angry and yelling and, and being and scorning people is seen as a weapon it's seen as like what you should do to combat the patriarchy or the discrimination but that's BS. It's just showing that you're a morally and intellectually shallow person, that you can't do something with graciousness. Uh, it's come to light since that ceremony that she isn't actually Native American. I don't, her sister came out and said that their family is from Mexico and Los Angeles. I didn't know if you knew that fact, but I wanted to throw that I in didn't know that. just in case. But the point yeah. still stands. Look at it. What, sure. Whatever. I just Look how graciously she was. Yeah. For the sake of accuracy. Yeah. Well. It's been disputed as to whether she was actually Native American. Your point, your point is taken. I hope that you guys enjoyed the show today. You can email me at julie at julie-hartman.com. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Julie R. Hartman. And remember, live is uh, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. So I'll see you tomorrow at 1 o'clock Pacific, 4 o'clock Eastern. And Julie Noted are the noteworthy clips that I pull from this live show in just a smaller format for your consumption. See you soon. Take care. Ha <laughs> ha